So, dear audience, dear contributors, <laughs> we'll now have a session about IT platforms among peers. I wish you all the warmest welcome to this session. Our team is, as I said, IT platforms among peers. Thank you very much for joining the session. The IT platforms enable communications in new ways among fellow people with disabilities and their families. The quality of the dialogue is different and important when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer support compared to the dialogue with the multidisciplinary supportive specialists only. So, um, it's also an important tool for empowering persons with disabilities. I'm not going to say more about that. But we have the specialists here. My name is Siri. Yes, like in the iPhone. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it was easier before. <laughs> You're well known now. <laughs> I work for the city of Oslo in the Department for Primary Health and Social Welfare. So I'll do my best to lead us through this session. We'll start with uh, four different interesting presentations. Each will last for nine minutes. And afterwards, we have about 20 minutes for questions. So please keep your questions for afterwards. I think you're used to this now. Okay. So, the first one is Rike. You're from the States, and she's a disability rights lawyer with expertise in special education law and policy. She has worked, um, she has work experience at the state, federal, and international levels of government, including the Office of International Disability Rights, at the U.S. Department of State. Here today, she will tell us about the exceptional lives. Thank you. So imagine that you've just received a diagnosis for yourself or for your child. Perhaps it's Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, autism, or intellectual disability. You start visiting some websites and you're overwhelmed with information. How will you find an occupational therapist? What is an occupational therapist? Will you or your child live on your own, have a job? You start hearing new terms like special education and supplemental security income, but you have no idea what they mean. What are you supposed to do first? That's where Exceptional Lives comes in. My name is Ricky Meyer, and I'll be sharing information about our free, personalized online platform starting with this short video. When you learn that your child has a disability or chronic illness, it's the beginning of a journey filled with a constant need for information and support. But we know that finding the relevant information can be frustrating and leave you feeling overwhelmed, anxious, and isolated. That's why we're here. Exceptional Lives leads you to the resources and action steps tailored specifically to your needs. We start with a few questions about your child and your specific needs. Then we take you directly to the resources you need and walk you through the processes you need to do. You can even call us for help. It's quick, easy, and efficient. All our information is constantly updated and written by experts in plain, simple language. Visit ExceptionalLives.org or call 1-844-354-1212 and start your own free personalized guide or resource list today. Okay, so as you just heard, and you've probably experienced on your own, finding information that's both accurate and easy to understand is a challenge. Parents and caregivers, as well as individuals with disabilities themselves, are often unaware of the services and benefits available to them. Many current resources are too complicated, as shown in the image on the right with lots of dense text, or an online search might generate thousands of requests, as shown on the left, 
with a mom typing the word autism into a search and getting more results than she could possibly go through. Therefore, it's difficult to determine whether someone qualifies for services or benefits and also how to apply. Our goal is to provide parents, professionals, and individuals with disabilities personalized, relevant, and accurate information so they can connect with the services they need. We focus on four key areas, medical care, government benefits, education, and social support. We empower and support families by providing trustworthy, easy to follow information written in language they understand. We promote self-help by equipping users with necessary tools to find resources to take action and help themselves or their children thrive. Our free online platform consists of three components and I'm gonna walk you through each of them. The first is personalized how-to guides that help parents navigate various disability-related processes and these guides are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as you're connected to the internet. Using a decision tree software, parents answer a few questions relevant to the topic and receive a customized guide specific to their situation. Topics include accessing special education, supplemental security income, early intervention, the transition to adulthood, health insurance, and employment for both employers and people looking for jobs. We use a three-step process to create our guides, which includes interviews and focus groups with parents, professionals, and experts from government agencies in relevant fields. The guides are actionable, meaning they not only inform about rights and processes, but they also provide action steps on how to navigate each required activity. The second component is a curated resource directory of disability-related services and providers. The directory is searchable by zip code and over 50 service filters. The directory has visual mapping, directions, and printing cap capabilities, as well as descriptions of the providers and contact information. The directory is constantly reviewed by data specialists on our team to ensure the information is accurate and up-to-date. And last but not least, we have an expert helpline. There's free chat, email, and phone support available, and a response is guaranteed within one business day. Our team can simultaneously access a guide if a user gets stuck, and can also direct users to other resources. And one other thing I want to mention is that our resources are currently available in two states in the US, and we're adding to our national database. We purposely take the state-by-state -state approach because laws and processes vary among jurisdictions. The incorporation of health literacy principles is key, to why the exceptional, is key to why Exceptional Lives works and is what sets us apart from other resources. Research shows that 15% of low-income families have a child with disabilities and 9% of those families have a child with a severe disability. All of our resources are written in plain language and utilize other research-based health literacy principles like the use of white space and infographics to ensure accessibility for people with low literacy. Other health literacy principles that we involve in all of our materials include user engagement with interactive software by asking and answering questions, which you can see in the second box, presenting small chunks of need-to-know facts and action steps with the option to read more detail, which is in the first box. There's an icon of a flag next to a term, and you can click on that, and uh, you'll get a pop-up box with more information. Help with new terminology by underlining terms that a user can click on for a brief definition. Testing with intended audiences, primarily through focus groups, principal forms, and providing instructions and visuals on how to navigate all of these features. Now I want to give just a brief overview of our impact from 2017. We've had over 300,000 visitors to our site since our launch. We distributed 44,000 materials through partners, including libraries and other community-based groups. There have been over 10,000 searches in our directories combined, so that's Massachusetts and Louisiana in the United States, and 2,435 entries of services and providers within our directories. We've had 343 support requests answered by phone, chat, and email. We've held 40 focus groups and presentations to ensure high quality resources, and we currently have 20 live guides. We have 11 in Louisiana, eight in Massachusetts, and one that's national. At Exceptional Lives, we measure success not only by the number of people we reach, but also by the quality of the interactions users have with our platform and the action steps they take thereafter. 
A key feature of our platform is the capability to collect data which informs unaddressed needs. We can track searches by zip code and inform providers if there is a need that's going unmet in a specific geographic area, such as applied behavioral analysis providers in the zip code 70791 in the graph on the right, which shows three searches across three different zip codes in one state. We can also collect information on the most common searches and the topics that create most confusion, as shown on the left, which highlights various searches from um, the whole state of Louisiana. We can share this information with other providers and perhaps influence legislators to provide incentives for local universities to train more providers and encourage them to work in an identified region. There we go. Something we're excited about is our new technology through which providers can act as instructors and create virtual workspaces where families can access customized information. Providers can release certain workflows at a time to prevent a family from getting overwhelmed with too much information. While we currently focus on two states, the workflow customization structure can be adapted for any content in any location, as you can see in the sample decision tree on the right. So while a diagnosis brings lots of stress, emotions, and questions, Exceptional Lives helps individuals, parents, and professionals navigate the world of services and supports so they and their children can thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky. So the next one, Shanti Raghavan. She's the founder and managing trustee of Enable India, a nonprofit organization established in 1999, working for economic and independence and dignity for persons with disabilities. Enable India has opened up more than 272 jobs for people with disabilities. Right now, we will have a focus and hear more about their IT platform, Enable Academy. Enable Money. Enable hmm? Money. And, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> you will uh, correct it. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Siri. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Enable India has been working for the last 18 years on the livelihoods of persons with disability, and we have worked to impact almost 11 disabilities. Uh, this journey has been wonderful, and uh, if this click works, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the journey has been wonderful where we've actually built different models and frameworks for scaling. But while we have been doing that, we have found gaps in our scaling. And I'd like to use a story to explain that gap. There's a gentleman called Ajmal. He lives in a small town in a state uh, called Karnataka. And he has five children. He earns $7 per month. I don't understand when you earn so less how, you know, in India we seem to produce children and, you know, we can't even feed them. And it's, it's really sad. And this person has a physical disability. Um, very less aspiration. He cannot actually come for any training. You know, we have this lovely model for scaling. We can do self-employment training for you. But how can somebody like him come all the way to a center which you have? He, he cannot come for that. He, you know, he has too many other priorities and he does not really have the aspiration uh, to do anything. You know, $7 is what I expect I will earn. That's all I can do. One of his friends told him about this interesting social network platform called Enable Vani. And he just dialed the number. He was told, don't worry, it's free for you. So he dialed the number. And he got a call back. For, it, it's a, he gave a missed call, and he got a call back from Enable Vani. And he gets connected to this platform. Suddenly he hears, uh, welcome to this platform, which is off, the, uh, you know, off persons with disability, for persons with disability, and by persons with disability. And you're welcome to listen to different posts on different channels. You can press a number to go to a different channel. You can press five to record your, your own posts or queries. And he starts every day listening to this channel. You know, he calls it and he finds out lovely stories of different entrepreneurs doing different, you know, different types of trades. And suddenly his aspiration grows. So now he starts posting on Enablevani and says, hey, I'm earning $7 per month. I want to do self-employment. Uh, can I even get a loan? He gets a crowdsourced list of 10 solutions on how he should go and apply for a loan. So he goes and does that. 
And today, he's earning five times what he was earning before. And this is what Enable Vani is all about. It actually addresses people like Ajmal, who are illiterate, who, who go through the cracks, who we cannot do everything to address each person's individual need. We can't have sustained engagement with a person like Ajmal, but this is what Enable Vani does. It redefines the statement on how we should push a service where we are saying the person with disability and the community are driving this platform. They own their problem and they're going to own their solution and that's how they work. The beauty about Enable Vani is it works. It's an unusual social network as you can realize. It does not require a smartphone. It is voice based so it can work anywhere around the country and obviously anywhere in the world. Um, and it addresses the hierarchy of needs of different people. So uh, I have another story of a gentleman who was a driver, he was not disabled, but he got into an accident because of negligence. He was driving the, uh, the bus and he got into an accident. Not only did he become spinal cord injured, actually four people died in the process. Can you imagine living through that pain? He's going through rehab and he also is going through the pain of actually you know, four people dying. When he came to know, he was, uh, you know, about Enable Vani, he was urged to post his story, and he did that. And guess what? That month, that was the highest forward, forwarded post. It went viral. And he got comments from other people who are spinal cord injured. He didn't feel alone anymore. He it was cathartic, the process of actually telling his story online, on this platform. Not only that, Many other people came to know about the organization where he was getting rehabilitated. And we came to know from that organization that more spinal cord injury people have uh, you know, approached the NGO and they're getting rehabilitated now. And that's the power of a network. It's not always about needs. There are people who are change makers. So there's a, a lady, Sheila, who is visually impaired and she's a teacher. She grow, goes from villages, village to village, and teaches blind children how, you know, braille. She has started using Enable Vani to actually promote it to parents and saying, listen to these stories. If you do the right education for your child, this is what the child can become. And is that not what you want? See how many lovely successful stories are there. So here's a change maker who is becoming even a better change maker because of Enable Vani. And that's the power of what a social network can do. So just to give you a background on what is happening behind the scenes in this platform, right? We have it moderated. So when a post lands on this platform, a moderator looks at the content, looks for the relevance, the quality of the audio, edits it a bit, puts it on the right channel. We do a lot of gamification, you know, the product management. So every month we post, these are the star users for the month. Now guess what? If A became the star user, I'm sure B wants to be a star user too. And that's how we make more people start contributing even better to the platform. Um, the impact, therefore, let me tell you so far, and uh, I'm happy to tell you that the numbers on your screen are already have changed because, you know, in one month, there's a lot that has happened. Every month it keeps increasing. So today, every minute, one call lands on Enable Vani. And, you know, we started about a year and a half back with no publicity, no marketing. It's reached 14 states. It's in the language of the choice of the person with disability. So we currently run it uh, in 13 states, it's one language, Hindi, and in another state, it's in Canada. And frankly, we can do it in any language because it's voice-based. Today, we have received more than 365,000 calls. And the best part is, in the beginning, the user-generated content was, uh, you know, about 10, 20, 30 percent. And today, 98% of the content is user-generated. That means the community is owning the platform and driving things. And that, to me, the Enable Vani is the basis for anything we do in the disability space. We should use the foundation of Enable Vani. So if it looks like I still have time, so I'd like to tell you one, uh, you know, one story, which is really the story of dignity. Uh, there was a blind, uh, uh, person who actually started learning music, he actually has six people in his family who are blind. His father, his wife, his three brothers. And this is what happens with consanguinity, right? Uh, you know, two cousins marry and then, you know, 
everybody in their family starts getting blind. So he was trying to eke a living by you know, being a musician, didn't get many gigs, as you can understand, in a village, what are you going to get? He came to know about Enable Vani, posted uh, things on the platform, and suddenly, over a period of a month and a half, when there were festivals, he started getting a lot of orders. And in a period of hardly one and a half months, he got enough money to pay for the surgery of his niece. And he says that this platform gives him dignity because he's equal to somebody else. He does not need to beg somebody to give him a gig. He, he's equal to somebody else, and today he is go, using Nam, Enable Wani to go to many other people, and he has become an evangelist for Enable Wani. So not only does he get dignity, he has become a promoter for Enable Wani. So we feel that this platform can be replicated with so many other countries, and this is the gift we feel Enable India can offer to anybody out there. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Shanti, for sharing this enthusiastic presentation. The next one is Kevin. Uh, he serves as the Managing Director of Understood, which is an online resource for the parents with, pe with children with learning and attention issues. It was created in 2014. You'll tell us more about it. But you have also, among other roles, you are the Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And you have a few other roles as well. <laughs> it, was quite, it was so much. <laughs> we look forward to hearing more. So Great. I tend to talk with my hands a lot, so I, so I thought I'd stand up so you could actually see me. Um, so thank you for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be here. I have learned so much in the last two days, actually particularly from my colleagues sitting at this table. Um, so I'm very excited. Understood is a comprehensive digital platform for parents of children with learning and attention issues like dyslexia and ADHD. One in five children have learning disabilities. These are learning and attention issues. These are challenges with reading, writing, math, organization. Um, these kids look just like you and I. I'm, in fact, I was one of those kids myself. Um, and often their challenges go unnoticed. Half of them never get diagnosed. So they go through life struggling, never knowing that there's a reason for it. So I wanna begin by introducing you to one young woman with learning and attention issues, Jade. We have a short video. My name is Jade, I'm in the eighth grade. And reading is a huge struggle for me. The teacher would ask me to read in front of the class aloud. I'd open my mouth, but no words would come out. Not because I couldn't speak, because I couldn't read the words on the page. They were jumping around, backwards, blurry, sideways. D was a B, W was an M. I just kept it all to myself. Like, no one can relate to me. This is just my problem, and I have to deal with it. I have to find a way to deal with this. Oh, my gosh. I can still remember the names. Um, idiot, dummy, you know, slow, special ed. It's like every day going through that takes a piece of you. After a while, you just like, you get this numb feeling, like it just doesn't bother you anymore. That's, that, that's when you get really worried. That's when you should get really worried. When you get this numbing feeling, someone calls you something, you're like, I don't care. They're right. That's the worst feeling in the world. <sighs> in the first grade and I am reading a book meant for toddlers. I am a very sad person. I, I would seriously just say that to myself. And then my mom would come in, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I was reading this book. She's like, oh, that's so cute. I'm like, mom, I can't read. The teacher talked to me. They said, we know that you have this ability and we know how to help you. I would go through one line, she's like, okay, stop. And then she said, and then she, then she had on the board, like it was like she already knew I was coming. It, each word was separated. And she had this special board with like, you know, little dots. And she was like, what is the sound? What is this word? I'm like, it's an S, S. And, and I felt really stupid. But at the end of the day, I could say that sentence. 
I would seriously walk around at the dinner table. I'm reading. I'm everywhere in the car. I'm sitting down in my roller skates reading a book. I ran. I walked into a treat. I had finished a book, and I felt awesome. And she reads the book, dancing around in my dad's football jersey. She's completed the championship. I was. I'm serious. And the crowd goes wild. I still have that jersey. I do, and it smells terrible. <laughs> So like I said, one in five children are just like Jade with learning and attention issues. And here's the bad news. Kids with learning and attention issues are far less likely to graduate from high school than their peers. We are twice as likely to be unemployed and more than twice as likely to end up in prison. We are just as capable as our peers, just as intelligent. We just learn differently. So. Several years back, we decided to attack this problem. Now, today I'm going to tell you how we went from that to where we are today, which is having served over 40 million people through the resources that we built. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we created and how, and particularly how we connect um, our parents with one another. Um, but first, let me start with where we were before we created Understood. First, we were seeing really um, disturbing outcomes for people with learning and attention issues. Um, we saw that when we talked to their families, despite the fact you're talking one in five kids, these parents felt totally alone in their journey, like they were the only ones going through this. We also saw that for them to get help, uh, it was either unavailable where they were or incredibly costly if they happened to live in an urban center with high quality help. And we saw that the organizations that were out there that existed to help these parents were fragmented. They were not working with one another. Um, and the funding that was out there was very, very limited. I know this is a challenge that many of us face in this room. There just wasn't a lot out there for them. Um, what was out there was largely quite confusing for them. So we did an incredible amount of research. Um, we talked to 2,200 families and dozens of experts from across the world, really. And here are the phases that we really worked in. First, we really flushed out the need. What is it that we want to create and how do we get to these families at scale? Not one at a time, not 10 at a time, but millions of families that need our help. Second, how do we make sure we're working with the best experts out there so families are getting the best information out there so it's no longer confusing or overwhelming? We knew we could not do this alone and be successful. So we brought together 15 other NGOs in the United States who worked with us to create Understood. We made sure that everything we created was expert vetted so that parents were getting completely accurate information. And then we started building. We created thousands of pieces of content, videos, slideshows, infographics, articles, addressing the needs that were identified in the research that we did with families. We wanted to make sure we could help parents at every single step of their journey and help them in a way that really resonated with them. And then we launched Understood in October of 2014. So here's what we launched with. I mentioned all of the content. We also created five state-of-the-art tools. One of them is called, called Through Your Child's Eyes. We heard from parents that they didn't understand their children's issues. For me, the hardest thing growing up was that my mother just never understood why I couldn't sit at the table and do my homework like my brothers could. Through your child's, child's eyes, we built stim simulations so that parents could see and experience what it's like to have a learning and attention issue themselves. We also created a tool called the Parenting Coach, which helps parents with those real-time, often social-emotional challenges that they're experiencing. Now, I mentioned that one of the things we learned in our research was that parents felt totally alone. We saw something really incredible happen in our first focus groups, and it's held true in everything we've done since, which is that while parents show up feeling totally alone, when you get them in a room together, they start to open up, often for the first time ever, sharing stories. Oh, that happened with your child's teacher? How did you deal with it? How did you work with the school successfully? What did you say to your child in this moment? So we worked to create create a safe space online for parents to connect with one another and share those stories and make those connections. We're also active on most social media channels. If you check out our Facebook page, any day you'll see incredible conversations happening among parents, sharing tips, tools, stories. 
We also know that some parents want face-to-face -face contact with other parents. So we launched an on-the-ground mobilization program. In 11 states, we have parent volunteers on the ground creating communities of support, support groups for parents to connect with each other on the ground using the resources we've created online, but to facilitate in-person conversations. Now, here's what we call our engagement pyramid. This has really informed everything that we've done. Um, we start by attracting users. We want to engage them more deeply, then empower them to take action for their child, to really start making a difference, and then mobilize them, connect them together to create systems change at a school district level or a federal level to really change the systems that are keeping their children back, really holding them back. Um, since then, I mentioned more than 40 million people have used Understood. That's now almost two and a half million people every month. Now, what's particularly interesting for this conversation is that nearly a million people a month have, are coming from outside of the United States. Um, so let me just conclude, those numbers are important, but they're not as important as the fact that half of the parents we're talking to say that their children are already doing better in school. 70% of parents say they're less stressed and more confident. If I could leave you with one piece of advice as you create your own IT platforms, it's this. Never forget that these aren't just users. These are people. These are parents with individual stories and lives and experiences and nuances, and everything you do should come back to that. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Kevin. So, last one, Jenny Lindström Bayar. She's the founder of Our Normal, a digital community for families with children with disabilities and special abilities. Jenny is herself a mother of two young girls, of whom one is born with Down syndrome. As a new parent, she started to look for ways to meet other families with similar experience. And this led her to the initiative Our Normal. We look forward to learn more about the digital platform. It's a hard word, digital. <laughs> <laughs> Vinelli from, well, you're from Sweden, so I think some of my English challenges <laughs> are <laughs> we understand each other. connecting there. <laughs> it's not our mother language, English. Well, at least not mine. <laughs> not mine either. So, thank you. Um, Okay, thank you, Sarah Project, for inviting me as well. My name is Jenny. Um, okay, so this is a photo of me and my husband, John, together with our oldest daughter, Vanya. Uh, Vanya is one day old at the picture, and she was born with Down syndrome. And at this moment, we are experiencing a, a turmoil of feelings, of course. Love, unconditional love, our first daughter. Uh, she smells so good, but we are struggling with handling all these new a piece of information as well, thinking about the future. What will it be like? Uh, what I could have wished for is that we would have got just a little glimpse of uh, this, our future, or our future, our daily life today. Uh, this is a photo from New Year's Eve this year. Um, and well, not because we are always this happy, smiling together every day, but because we have a normal life, we do normal stuff together. Uh, things that I was wondering a lot about in the beginning. And here together with younger sister Hilary as well. Because if it's one thing that really can be called a moment of truth, uh, that's when you as a parent deal with the fact that your child has some sort of a diagnosis or a disability. Uh, it can be experienced as a moment of uh, sadness, uh, despair, relief, curiosity, fighting spirit. It's like no one feels the same. But what most of us feel is that we look for um, others with whom we can identify ourselves as families and also with whom we can connect. And this was one of the first things we started to think about as a new family. And for us, um, our journey started with a phone number. We got a phone number from a friend's friend who happened to have a child with Down syndrome. So I sat down with this piece of paper and I dialed that number and we decided to, to meet. And that meeting with that family it totally changed our life. 
that was life-changing because we got to see normal family life, uh, which was really important. Whoops. Um, okay. Okay, so that made, um, after that experience, I started to think there are so many digital platforms connecting peers like backpackers, singles, new parents, but there weren't anything for us really. Uh, and we started to, me and my husband started to talk around to other parents having children with other types of disabilities, and they were experiencing similar to what we did experience in the beginning. Um, so we decided to set up a non-profit organization, um, get together with some tech people, get some funding, and we created ournormal.org slash en. Uh, so it's a basic platform connecting families. Uh, the logic is simple. You will recognize the idea, I think. Uh, you have a family profile uh, where you describe yourself. So... Uh, you can choose to be more anonymous or very, you show your full picture and you have a story and then you tag your story with your experiences. So not just a label with type of disability or so, but interests or languages you speak, uh, ages of children, because we're not after any labeling here, but we are after making connections between families. And then it's a simple contact form, so you can select how you'd like to get in touch with other um, families, and also if you have maybe an open blog or an open Instagram account or so, you can find each other through this contact form. And well, the platform is not only for new families, like in the beginning of the journey. We can see that it's also, there can be many reasons for connections when you are going for a, a trip or you look for adapted sports or you, maybe you look for siblings in the same age as yours or so. Um, so that can be relevant in different periods of times during um, life as well. And we work across disabilities and special abilities uh, because we want to build an empowering and really supportive network. And we think that we can have so much to gain if we can connect and not just split up in several different types of um, experiences. And also we look at connecting people across geographical borders as well in the future. Um, okay, so so far we don't have those figures yet. We just launched, so we are, Sweden is a small country as well, but there are new dots coming to this map all the time now. Uh, so there are families signing up, and we, as you can see, we cover already a wide range of different types of experiences. I think the animation, oh well, here it goes. Um, so that's, we, that's where we are at the moment, and then there are so many different ways already of, that the families decide uh, on how they want to describe themselves. Uh, okay, that was a whole list, but it didn't really follow here. Um, okay, some um, uh, feedback. A fantastic initiative. Reading all the family presentations make us feel less lonely. Uh, it has been great to see photos of other families and to get in touch with others who are struggling with some similar issues. We hope for even more families to join. And also from a counsellor at the Habilitation Centre saying, we meet a lot of families who feel very lonely in the situation. Our normal is a great possibility for families to connect. Mm. But we, so we've launched this in, in Sweden and Scandinavia, but we want to reach out because we would like to see if this can really spread across countries as well. Uh, that's, that's what we hope for, because it would be cool if our special experiences as families also can be door openers to new cultures and new experiences. Um, and not just for uh, the children, for parents in the families, but also for siblings, because siblings also look for others with whom they can identify themselves with in those situations. Uh, so we want to reach out to you here as well, and so you can find some more information about how to become an Our Normal Ambassador. We would like to build up a network so we can reach out to uh, um, supporters and ambassadors in other countries. I have some flyers here so I can give it to you later as well. Um, 
And just some short words about sustainability in the future. So we are a non-profit organization. We will say non-profit. And our main focus is the connection part. But we also want to share uh, stories, our normal stories. So not clickbait stories with uh, uh, hero stories or just sad stories, but normal daily life stuff. That's what I was looking for in the beginning, and I'm still looking for it. Um, but also to have another supportive part uh, with, uh, where we can have some... Uh, curated uh, marketing services and so on, so we can have some income, uh, so we not just only depend on grants. Mm. Okay, and just to wrap up, our mission is to enrich the lives for families and children with disabilities and special abilities through wider social family networks, because we want to erase the feelings of isolation and loneliness that we know might exist out there. And we hope that you want to join us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for sharing this with us. So now we are, have still time to have questions. Is there Anyone? If, well, I have, if nobody has a question, I will, yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I appreciate the initiatives uh, taken by uh, enable body from India. I am very much interested about knowing more about that because we have the similar circumstances in South Asia, and I represent from Nepal. And uh, as um, this is a very vibrant uh, mechanism to provide information to those who need immediately about the services and the other benefits they can immediately get. So I'm wondering how the information can be accessed to those who are deaf and hard of hearing, as well as for those who are intellectual disabled children and the people. So how the information can be made accessible for those? That's my question. So I would like to have a very uh, brief uh, information later again, uh, because I would like to adapt the similar technology in our organization also. Uh, sir, thank you so much for that. Your name, I didn't uh, get it. Yes, I'm Birendra Raj Pokhrel. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm glad somebody asked that question because obviously if it's voice-based, it's not accessible for the deaf. So, two things. The technology partner that we're working with is working on at least a text-based part and an app, but when it's an app, it's going to be a smartphone-based thing. So, there is that problem. But having said that, currently how it is being used is by deaf parents and deaf organizations. So there is one deaf organization who just did four posts in, you know, in uh, some months back. And they received more than 4,000 forwards, shares, etc., which not only went to deaf parents, but many people uh, heard it. Interestingly, there have been people who are visually impaired who heard it, who had people who are deaf in their village and they started talking about it to those families. So that's how it is happening currently. Uh, one of the models we, one of the main things we do is we have strategic partners in any, you know, as part of the Enable Vani uh, in every region, like NGOs, etc., who start using the platform for their benefit. So we are actually tying up with intellectual disability organizations because the first thing is the family member needs to take part. So those talks are on with uh, some Delhi-based organizations. They already would be posting, but we want to make it a bit more structured. When you have a strategic partnership, you can kind of decide how the product can benefit uh, their, uh, you know, their stakeholders, which are people with intellectual disability. So we've not looked right now at accessibility for intellectual disabled per se, but currently it's being used by their families. And just to let you know, our replication strategy uh, initially is to work with our neighboring countries, which includes Nepal, 
uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So, uh, you know, as soon as I'm done, I'll definitely give a card. And uh, for everybody here, we have a booth uh, next to the cafe. Uh, even Kevin, we all are that side, and I know Exception Lives is nearby. So do visit us, and I think we will be able to give you much more information. Thank you. Thank you, Shante, for answering. We have a question there, please. Um, hello, my name is Raluca Popescu, and I'm from Romania. I'm uh, representing uh, something to say uh, NGO. It's an NGO for self-advocates, persons with disabilities, mixed disabilities. Uh, and uh, my question is, there are any platforms, uh, I don't know, international, for speci especially for uh, self-advocacy organizations, because uh, we are searching to, to share and to make uh, connections with, with them around the world. Uh, I don't know if there are any. That information would be useful for me and also for my colleagues. So if there is anyone in the room or in front who knows, that would be very helpful. Thank you. So we aren't focused specifically on self-advocacy, but within our guides we have a lot of tips on self-advocacy, so that might be one place to start. And um, I think a, a way to connect different self-advocacy groups would be a great way to go in the future, since there are so many people here too. Um, just uh, some information. There is a group called SAFI in India, Self-Advocacy Forum of India. Um, I, you know, it, I don't know whether it's national based, but I do know in the state of Karnataka where Bangalore is, uh, especially with persons with intellectual disability, we have quite a lot of self-advocates with intellectual disability, and uh, there are NGOs who are also enabling that whole SAFI group. And if you want, I can put you in touch with the organization who works with SAFI. Thank you, that would be helpful because we have also in our NGO persons with intellectual disabilities. Oh, wonderful. And uh, it would be great for us. Yeah, Thank and you it's so working much. wonderfully well. It's extremely successful, so I'll okay. put you in touch. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. We now got approved that the Zero Project networking is working. <laughs> Perfect. I can vouch for that. <laughs> Question? Yes, please. Okay, so I have a question for Jenny. Uh, you know, your presentation touched me because I'm the very similar situation happened to me after my son was born with a form of cerebral palsy. But one of the things that I always had difficulty with is some parents can be extremely negative. And how do you, how much monitoring do you have to do of the platform? And is that an issue that you encounter, that some parents are just complaining and you know that can bring down the whole group and what you really want to do I think is empower people and, and lift people up. So I know this is something that I struggled with you know, personally as a parent. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean there and I think what we are after with the name also are normal is to not just to to select between the very positive or very negative side, because those are the voices I hear out there. Either you are, uh, everything is possible, or it's uh, everything is impossible, basically. And it's very seldom either, or it's it's a struggle, but it's many positive stories as well. So that's what we want to share with our normal stories that we you know, curate and the interviews we do, and also that we want to be more that people start to engage more to send their own stories. But, but also we can see why we set up this, because there are many Facebook groups for parents mm -hmm. out there. Why, why set up a special platform then? But it's because the Facebook groups, um, you sh I can see this tone there as well, that in some of mm -hmm. them maybe the, 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 there is a lot of complaining, or it can be just um, three families who are super positive posting all the time. Like it's very hard even for a very active moderator in a Facebook group to kind of moderate that. So here, 
you can select, because it's based just to connect one-to-one, -one. so then mm -hmm. you can select some families to, to connect with, and if, well, they connect back, then you can start, you can follow each other on Instagram, you can decide and have a meeting, because you select the way you're interested in getting in touch. So that's one way, because they only have a certain area to present mm -hmm. themselves, and then we want the interaction to happen in other places. And also because in Facebook groups, sometimes I think there's too much private information shared among mm -hmm. uh, loads on loads of parents uh, in some of those groups, and they share very private stories because they are, well, they're looking for, of course, answers or so, but then we would prefer them to take those uh, connections one-to-one. -one. That's really helpful, thank you. I'll just add one quick thing, which is we encountered something similar, and what we did was we worked with parents to create community guidelines that we post within our community on the board, as well as on social media. It allows us then, when a conversation gets too negative, to say, we all came together and agreed to abide by these standards. You know, unfortunately, you haven't. Here's other language that might be helpful, um, but it's less us telling them you did something bad and more us saying, together as a community, we agreed to talk in this way. And I also want to tell you something because I think this is a wonderful question because when you talk of networks, the way we look at it is that um, if the community is at a certain place, mm. they need to get beyond that phase, but together. So uh, you know how when there's a running race uh, and sometimes they'll have this pace maker person who goes around? Mm -hmm. so, so That's what we've done in our platform, right? Because you know that the tone can get negative. So what we have done is, as we said, user-generated content, but the other part is we do have curated content. And our curated content goes a little deep beyond those you know, superficial mm -hmm. things that come in the mind. So it goes through the journey of showing some negativity, what that person was facing, and what they did, the details mm -hmm. on how they overcame it. That's great. So you're, you're, you're actually pacing them to go where you want them to go. It's suggestive, but it works. And that's why the tone of the platform is much better mm -hmm. then. And I think all these suggestions help. A very good question, actually. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Lauren, and I'm representing U.S. Embassy Vienna. And this question might run similar to the question on self-advocacy, but I thought I would present it anyways. Um, I noticed a lot of these platforms are for families. Are there any platforms, or have you observed any need for a platform for individuals with disabilities, um, maybe younger generation, for a social connecting, social network, that kind of thing? I can start to answer that we get that question quite a lot when we present the platform. So there's definitely a need for it, I would say, but, but we don't have the experience ourselves in the organization. So we say, yeah, we can be a, a collaborator or we can get, like, share some of our learnings where if someone wants to set up that. And I know there's a research project in Uppsala in Sweden, for example, for that. But, uh, so I know there's a need, but I haven't really found a, a, a good uh, platform for that yet. I would just add two quick things to that. One is, I mentioned we uh, were created by 15 partners that came together. One of them is called Eye to Eye, which is for young people with learning and attention issues in the United States. We created a great partnership where you know, a lot of their materials say, eye to eye is for young people, understood is for their parents. So it allows us to steer you know, young people to eye to eye, and them to steer parents to us. The other thing is, at the National Center for Learning Disabilities, we've done um, some research on reaching young people with learning and attention issues, and one of the great challenges that we uncovered in our research is that for particularly with learning and attention issues, they were very hesitant to identify, to raise their hand and say, yes, that's me, and I want to opt into a group or a service. So I think it's going to be much more about kind of reaching them where they are in language that resonates with them and keeping it pretty safe. Yeah, building off of what Kevin just said, um, we've also heard the need for social networking among peers too, but one of the things that we do is use language that people themselves can understand. So, um, so if someone's transitioning to adulthood and 
they want to know the steps for themselves, they can go in, go through the guide, and come out understanding what they need to do. So that runs through, um, I would say the, maybe the two most relevant are the transition to adulthood and also looking for a job and getting prepared for a job. More questions? Well, I will, uh, I have a few here. So we still have five minutes. So I think we should use our time. <clears throat> Ricky, I have a question for you. When you speak to parents and professionals, what do you find is their biggest issue? Thank you. So there are really two big things that come up a lot when we have focus groups and we have them with different parents from different states, from different socioeconomic statuses, really trying to get the whole range of who we're trying to reach. And the two biggest things are how to access different systems that provide resources. So in the US, accessing the healthcare system is very different than accessing the education system. So that's one that comes up. And the second is cost and the financial everything associated with finances and having um, a disability. So a power wheelchair can be thousands of dollars and knowing how to access benefit, government benefits to help you be able to afford that is something that comes up a lot. So through the guides we try to address how you can go through those systems. Thank you. Shanti, I, I was very curious about how you meet people with hearing impairments, but we, you, you yes, we have yeah. answered it. Um, but I would, do you have other challenges you want to, well, we're not going to be challenge focused, but still I'm curious. Uh, what kind of challenge? With uh, starting and uh, having the whole platform established. Yeah, I think um, we've just been pleasantly surprised with how things moved. Um, our biggest challenge was more in our mind thinking that will really a social network, I mean, what, what are we thinking? Uh, you know, will this really work? Our biggest challenge, I would say, has been how to do product management well and the data analytics. You know, you really, if the, because it was evolving and it, it hit us that, oh my God, we're getting so many calls. So the main thing is how well you analyze the data and therefore understand, is this group of persons with disability from these regions, are they really you know, are they addressing their needs? Is there something more we need to do from a product perspective? That's been, it, it's not a challenge that can't be, you know, uh, taken care of. We just, mm -hmm. you know, things have happened so fast, we're just catching up with it. So I think it's more because the numbers have been so high, uh, you know, we will be putting a product management team in place, a bigger data analytics team. I've been talking to Kevin and learning a lot about how uh, this should be done. And that's kind of where we are because today I think when we're talking IT platforms and if you've heard from the others, everything is about the more you can be in control by analyzing the data and setting the pace, uh, the, then the platform takes over. The technology is there, you know, but it's how you use it uh, you know, efficiently and kind of move the meter. So that's where we are. Thank you. Yeah, question, please. Yes. Hi, yes, I have a question for all the panelists. And I'm just curious if you all had a fantasy of what uh, you could create the IT world for you and what it would look like for the people you're trying to support. What do you think that ultimate platform, that ultimate solution would be? Uh, can I go ahead? If, yeah. yeah. You, Tell me how much time you have. <laughs> we have 30 so, seconds. You know, no problem, it can be done. So, you know, we've got artificial intelligence now, we have machine learning now, and yeah, Amazon has it and says, you like this book, you know, you could also like these other books, but I can see tremendous value on using machine learning for the work all of us do. Because what are we doing in our brains as entrepreneurs is, you're finding patterns all the time, and then you're finding a solution for that pattern and then you pilot it and you do things. That can be taught to a machine. We can move faster. Because since we're talking about individuals, do you realize we come to these conferences and there's always another need we seem to be addressing? When can we get out of this game, right? So we can do bigger things if we actually start using artificial intelligence and machine learning for uh, development world and especially persons with disability because the diversity is too high. 
you have late blind versus born blind, then accident blind, and then that's only covering blind. You're not even talking low vision or uh, an acid survivor who has vision impairment along with 100 other things. <coughs> then you take each disability and, you know, it's, it's just too vast. And um, so it should almost like, you know, when a person with disability says, this is the job I want, people like you already have taken these kind of jobs in these kind of companies. I mean, how cool will that be? So then the NGO folks, all the folks working in this can do something much better, something that only a human brain can do. So I think I've done with three minutes. I, if, if there's any way you can help, because I've been talking to everybody about artificial intelligence, any, anybody who's IT savvy, right? I've just been eating their brain, so I can eat yours too. So <laughs> I've had some lunch, I still have. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. I think we have to end it here. Uh, we could have been talking for a long time about all these topics. It's very interesting. It's been brilliant to sit here with you for uh, specialists in this theme. And the audience, thank you so much for being active and listening and being in this session. What more to be said? Well, enjoy the rest of the afternoon and evening and the day tomorrow at the conference. Enjoy. Thank you. Siri, Siri, Dankeschön. Dankeschön, Siri. <laughs>